sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. And if you're watching from across Four Corners, Florida, we invite you to come out and join us every Sunday morning in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy at 10 o'clock. Citrus Ridge Academy is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road. And we look forward to seeing you there next week. Now, each week when we begin our online service, we start out by singing a song together. And I just want to celebrate the goodness of God. He is always showing His goodness and favor and grace in our lives. He's always doing great things. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great What our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things He has done great things Let's pray together. God, we come to you today with thankful hearts because you're so good. You're awesome. You're amazing. You are so wonderful. And we praise you for the great things that you're doing in our lives. And now, as we set aside this time to look into your word, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, cause your truth to come alive on the inside of us and help us to be doers of your word not just hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to week number seven in our series from the book of Ruth. And I've entitled this series, In Pursuit of Hope. The Bible tells us in Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written before 
were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And we can look at these Old Testament narratives and we can learn things. You know, it's a wise person who learns from the mistakes of other people instead of having to learn it on their own the hard way. And by looking at these Old Testament narratives, we can learn a lot of things. We can learn how to do it wrong and avoid that, or we can learn how to do it right and embrace that by the successes and failures of other people. And through it all, we, we come into a deeper relationship with Christ, and we come to a position where we should live in hope. And in the New Testament, the word hope that's found in Romans 15, 4 that we just read, we might have hope. It doesn't mean hope so or wish so. It means that we have a confident expectation and we're so confident that we can have joy in advance just waiting on our good God to do great things. See, as followers of Christ, we should never live in dread Maybe you've said, boy, I dread this or I dread that. I dread tomorrow or I dread this holiday season because of people I have to get together with. No, we should not live in dread. We should live in hope, a confident expectation to see the goodness of our God in our lives and so confident that we can go ahead and get happy about it even when everything's not going our way on the outside. So Ruth, the book of Ruth, through studying this narrative, we can find hope. That's why I've entitled it Ruth in Pursuit of Hope. Now, let's go back to our characters because we have Naomi and Ruth. They're both widows. They moved back to Bethlehem, Naomi did, and brought her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who was a Moabite, came back to Bethlehem, back to God, back to God's people. They had returned, but when they returned, they're widows. And I like to say that they're broke, busted, and disgusted. I mean, they're at the rock bottom. They're at the bottom of the barrel. They have serious issues. Two widows with nothing living basically destitute lives as beggars, and that was pretty much their lot in life at this point when they come back from Moab. They had no food. They had no family. And on top of that, Naomi had extreme bitterness because of what she had gone through. As a matter of fact, Naomi was so bitter, if you don't remember, that she changed her name from Naomi, which means pleasant, Tomorrow, which means bitter. She said, I don't, when people call my name, I don't want them to say the word pleasant anymore. I want them to say the name bitter because I'm a bitter old woman. I mean, that's, that's how bitter she was. She wanted everybody to know that she was mad at God and that she's mad at the world and that she's been defeated and she's just down and don't, I'm, I'll never be pleasant again. I'm just going to be bitter the rest of my life. So I'm changing my name to bitter. What a place to be in. So, I've entitled today's message the subtitle as this. Hey, hey, Naomi, it's time to turn your cup over. I want you to think about this because when Naomi is just mad at the world and mad at God and mad at her situation, if, if we ever come to the point of bitterness, it's like we have turned our cup over to where we're not in a position to receive anything from God. Surely you've heard the old gospel songs about, and even a new <laughs> Christian song that's on the radio about God filling our cup to where it's running over because He's a God of blessing. He's a God of life. He's a God of... Of, of love and giving, and that's who He is. But when we have our cup turned over with bitterness, we're not in position to receive the outpouring of God or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the outpouring of God's blessings because our cup's turned over. 
So I'm saying this about Naomi, but I may also be saying it about you. As long as you live your life in bitterness, as long as you live your life even in dread, we talked about living in hope. If we're living in dread, if we're living in fear, if we're living in bitterness, then our cup is not turned the right way to receive everything, all the blessings and freedom and everything from God when our, when our cup is turned upside down. So, hey, Naomi, or hey, you put your name in it. It's time to turn your cup over because God's a good God. Listen, God loves you. God loved Naomi, and we've already talked about how she blamed God for something that God didn't do. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you. This is God talking. It says, says the Lord, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good, not for disaster. To give you a hope and a future. That's God's plan for you and for me and for Naomi and for Ruth. That's God's plan because he's a good God. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. What does that tell us? If we don't have our cups turned over where God can't bless us, if we have our cups turned upright, and if we love God and thank God, and worship God, even when everything around us is not going our way. Listen, it says, for those who love God, it doesn't mean that God causes everything to work together for everybody, but for those who love God specifically, that's who this promise is for. Those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them, He's going to take the trouble and the pain and even maybe the tragedies that we go through, he is going to somehow do some good things. But listen, we have to be looking for those good things. I mean, I have friends who went through seasons where they had cancer and they were taking radiation and things like that and chemo and they were down and they were experiencing the pain of this fallen world and the things that happen in this fallen world. But you know what? Even in the midst of that, they were able to talk to other patients and they were able to share Christ with them and other patients came to know Christ. Some of the medical personnel, doctors and nurses, came to know Christ. Now listen, some people would say, God gave me this cancer so that this good would come no, it says that's the, that can be the result of the tragedy and pain that we go through. We can have a good result. Something good can come out of it. It's not the purpose of the pain or of the tragedy or what we've gone through or the disease. Because there is no purpose. The purpose of cancer is to steal from you and to kill you and destroy you. Cancer does not come from God. Just like the death of Naomi's husband and Ruth's husband, God did not take them because he needed another angel in heaven. I mean, that's, that's not the way it works. God does not kill, steal, and destroy his people. He doesn't do that. He came to give us life, Jesus said. But in the midst of the tragedies that take place, sometimes by our own choices and the seeds that we've sown, hey, when we... When we come back to God and say, God, I know I've been sowing the wrong seeds and I've been reaping the wrong harvest and I know it's not your fault, but now I want to sow seeds of goodness and towards the spirit and I want to reap the good things, the good harvest that you have for me. You know what? Even in those old troubles, something good can happen. Something good from come up, can come up from that because God can bring good out of terrible. Just like it says in the Old Testament. I mean, he, he specializes in this, in giving beauty in the place of ashes. Yeah, ashes, there had to be some trouble. There had to be some destruction going on. But God can bring beauty out of ashes. 
He can bring the oil of joy out of mourning. We don't have to live in mourning and grief for the rest of our lives. We don't have to live in dread for the rest of our lives because God can bring us up and bring something good. Can bring something good. That's why I've, I'm going to offer a Dean Forrest version <laughs> of Romans 8, 28. We should know that God's purpose and plan for His people is to bring something good out of every trouble or tragedy that we faced. We should know that. We should expect that. We should be looking for it because so many times if we're trapped in the tragedy or in the grief or in the loss or in the pain, we have our cups turned over. Hey, we got to turn that cup over. We got to turn it up to come to the place where we can receive the comfort and the blessing and the provision of God. And we got to be looking for something good. God, I know that your purpose, what you're going to do as a result of what I've gone through, I know that you want to do something good. So I want to be on your page and I want to find it and I want to see it and I want to take part in that. And I want to experience that good that is your plan in my life always in everything I go through. So turn your cup over. Hey, Naomi, turn your cup over. Hey, Dean, when you, when you face an issue or something, going, hey, turn your cup over because God's a good God and God's got a blessing and God's going to bring something good your way. Beauty for ashes, joy in the place of mourning. That's who God is. Now, I got to preach and I got on a tangent there, but listen, there were seven weeks of barley and wheat harvest in Bethlehem. Seven weeks. And now that seven weeks has come to an end because it's time for the final harvest of the second crop. See, the harvest and the gleaning season, because Ruth was just gleaning from the fields, even though Boaz was giving her extra and showing favor. We talked about favor a couple of weeks ago, and she was getting extra, and she was being blessed, and, and because she had positioned herself for favor by her actions and her choices. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago? But now harvest season is over. Gleaning season is over. So what is Ruth and Naomi, what are they going to do? Now what? Now what? Let me tell you something. Through the loving kindness of Ruth and the unmerited favor of Boaz, Naomi now is finally in a position to turn her cup right side up, to turn her cup over. Because today we're going to find out that Naomi moves from despair and depression to hope and future. I'm going to say that again. Naomi is going to move from despair and depression to hope and future. So let's take a look as we open up Ruth chapter 3 today. Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. One day, Naomi said to Ruth, My daughter, it's time that I found a permanent home for you so that you will be provided for. Boaz is a close relative of ours, and he's been very kind by letting you gather grain with his young women. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now do as I tell you. Take a bath, put on perfume, dress in your nicest clothes, then go to the threshing floor. But don't let Boaz see you until he is finished eating and drinking. Be sure to notice where he lies down. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down there, and he will tell you what to do going to go to verses 7 through 9. After Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he lay down at the far end of the pile of grain and went to sleep. Then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. 
around midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up and turned over. He was surprised to find a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she replied. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. Now, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago um, when I said, when we looked at when, when Boaz spoke a blessing or spoke a prayer over Ruth in Ruth 2 verse 12, he said, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings, that's the important word here, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. See, God had told his people that he was their refuge. Maybe you've heard that word before in, in Bible study. God is the refuge. God is a strong tower. God's people are supposed to come to him like a mother hen with her chicks. If a hawk starts flying over the chicken yard, all of a sudden the mother hen spreads her wings out and the chicks, her small, her babies, her chicks, they come run under her wings for protection. Because mama's going to take care of her chicks. She's going to protect them. She's going to guard them. And that word wings is the exact same Hebrew word that Naomi brings back to Boaz as she's laying at his feet. She says, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. See, the corner of your covering or a blanket is the exact same word as wing. And the Bible even talks about there's a messianic prophecy that says when the Messiah comes, there will be healing in his wings. And even the prayer shawl of the rabbis, the prayer shawl, the ends of that, where, the, where, the, where they tied knots as they prayed to God, that was even called the wings. See, this is it's talking about a covering, a protection. She wasn't just cold. <laughs> Listen, she wasn't just cold and wanted a little bit of cover. It's, I mean, and we can read this in a, in, a, um, in a Western understanding, I guess we would put it that way, in our English language. We can just read it and it, it really don't mean a whole lot. It means like, oh yeah, she's out there. It's midnight. She's cold. So she's like, hey, Boaz, can you share a little bit of covers with me? <laughs> I mean, that, it, it would be easy for us to just look at it that way. But when she says, spread the corner of your covering over me, she is saying, you have shown me favor. Because she goes on to say, for you are my family redeemer. You are my kinsman redeemer. You are a close family. And if you're willing and if you're capable and if you're able you can redeem me, and that's why I'm here tonight. I'm telling you that I need to be redeemed. Me and Naomi and our, and our family, our husbands are dead. We need to be redeemed. All that was tied up in this. Spread the corner of your covering over me. I want to put myself under your protection, under your redemption. She was asking to be redeemed. Now, here's, here's what we need to understand, and this is what God's laid on my heart to share with you today, because Ruth is now at a point where she has been gleaning, taking the leftovers and a little bit extra that Boaz was offering to her by favor. She, you know, God had told him to leave the corners of the field and leave some behind for the poor and for the widows, so that's called gleaning when you would go to the field and you would just get enough to be able to survive and to stay alive. You're just, you're just getting a little bit. And Boaz has shown favor by telling his people to leave extra. And then he's inviting her to the workers luncheon every day and those kind of things. 
So she was getting more than that, but she was at the point, and Naomi was at the point where they knew that just gleaning, they, they wanted more than that. They wanted more than just gleaning. And here's what I want us to think about today. Because it seems to me in our United States religion, church system that we're involved in that so many people compartmentalize God and church and the things of God. So many people like my, my wife's experience was when she was growing up, they had a shelf by the door and that's where they kept their Bibles. And when they went to church, they would pick up their Bibles off of that shelf and they would take their Bibles to church and have worship and Bible study and things like that. But then when they got back home, their Bibles went back on that shelf by the door and they never even thought of picking up their Bible during the week because their religion and their Christianity and their relationship with God and their consideration of God, it wasn't a moment-by-moment, moment, day-by-day thing. It was like, that's what Sunday is for. And, hey, they were, they were very committed. I mean, we could say that's what Sunday mornings are for. That's what Sunday nights are for. That's what Wednesday nights are for. Because when I grew up, it was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and then other things too. But it seemed like in my life and in my wife's life and Gannon's life, this church religion relationship with God was compartmentalized to those times. And here's what I want to present to you, that if the only time you think about God pretty much is while you're watching this video, but then the rest of your life is just about you. Um, if the only time you think about God is when you go to a church service and in the rest of the time you don't even consider God or walk with God or live by faith and, and all that kind of stuff, then I don't get Sunday school on me. Don't say, well, I always remember God. And think, let's talk about reality. Let's, let's talk about our, our real lives. I mean, do we just go about our lives and not even consider God until it's time to get together with other people to worship God? I want to encourage you today. Don't be content with gleaning from God. Don't just be content with gleaning. Just getting a little bit of spiritual here and a little bit of spiritual here. See, because that looks like Ruth just going to the field and picking up. But Ruth has got to the point now where she is going to Boaz looking for redemption. She's She's looking for a covenant relationship with Boaz for her family to be redeemed, her, her father-in-law and her husband, for, for their life, for, for Naomi, everybody to be redeemed. See, she wanted more. And I want to encourage you today that there's more. If you find yourself compartmentalizing your faith to just where... It's only a part of your life when you're going to church or, or watching church on, on, online. Listen, God wants us to not just glean from Him. He wants us to daily live in a covenant relationship with Him, an open communication, praying without ceasing, walking in the Spirit, living by faith, you see, here's the deal. There's so much more. And just like we can look at Ruth and say, hey, Ruth, there's so much more than just getting a little bit of wheat and a little bit of barley out of Boaz's field. There's so much more. She knew that there was so much more. So she said, hey, will you redeem me? I want to be in a relationship with you. I don't, I don't want to just glean from your fields anymore. And may the Holy Spirit, who is inside of us when we're in Christ, may, may, he, may we yield to Him, because I know He's always saying, look, there's more to this relationship. Even if, you're, 
even if you're in covenant relationship with God, and even if you're living by faith and walking in the Spirit, I want to tell you there's more. God's a good God. God's a big God. We will never exhaust everything that, that we can know and experience in Him because He's so amazing and so wonderful. Here's the deal. Don't be content with where you are because there's always deeper relationship. There's always deeper understanding. There's always deeper discernment. There's always deeper revelation because God is so amazing and wonderful. Let's pray together. God, I thank you. I thank you that we could spend our earthly lives here just diving deeper into a relationship with you and we would never exhaust you because you're God and you're big and you're huge and your love for us is greater than we understand and know. And even as we grow in understanding, you know what? There's so much more. Help us to never just plateau out and say, oh, we're good. We're good. We're good with just getting what we got. Draw us close. Let us live and dwell in your shadow under your wing as you as our refuge. That's where we want to live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us here today at Elation Church and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? In doing that, you'll be coming alongside of us and our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church.